right, welcome and good morning, church family. Our guests and friends, we're glad to be with you today. Um, hey, I really liked uh, seeing families on stage. Wasn't that, wasn't that beautiful? That was beautiful. Well done. <laughs> Jeff and Stefana, Tony, Brenda, Carol Ann. It's Family Sunday, so we wanted to make the best of it, and I think we were all encouraged. I mean, I was encouraged. I just, I just love seeing families here. Pray, church for nursing mothers, pray church for crawlers and toddlers, pray church for teethers, pray church for disruptions, pray for crying babies, yeah, Uh, pray for preteens and elementary students and teenagers. Pray for our young adults. Come on, somebody. Pray. Do not get that old man get off my yard feeling, church. I'm serious. I'm serious. We want a bunch of crying babies. We want a bunch of teething babies. We want kids running on stage when service is over. All right, I know they probably shouldn't be up here, but you know. Listen, I grew up in the Catholic church, and that place was crazy sometimes, and uh, Latino mass. I mean, kids would be like trying to run up on the altar. Pr- a priest wasn't having it, man. A priest would be like, get your kid, you know, like, they'd, like, don't defile the sacred altar, you know what I mean? Like, get it down. Like, there'd be kids all over the place. Like, you want a church like that. We want to always have a family Sunday. Got to get a hearty amen, somebody. And so in your prayers, add that. Say, I want, God, please send some, please, Lord, Lord, we want Lord, my desire is, next time you're out and you see a mom or a dad, invite them to church. Next time you're out and you see some kids, invite them to church. Invite them to enter into a resurrected life with Jesus. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. That's why we choose to do what we do. We want to share what we have with others. I'm excited to offer to you something that we did last year. It's called Renewal Retreat. Just a couple announcements. Renewal Retreat. It was a, a great success last year. We had a great time. 75 people showed up, volunteers, people who wanted to volunteer, came here to this place, and we poured into our volunteers. So we're doing it again March 11th. We're really excited about it. We're planning it. And so it's just a few weeks out. And so if you have volunteered in any way for our congregation, or if you want to get involved with volunteering, it's going to be a whole weekend of it. And so we're looking forward to pouring into you some of our people who love this church and give your time, talents, and treasure. Come, make sure to mark it on your calendar, block it off. We're going to spend a day together. We're, last year, if you remember, it was not only informative, inspiring, and all the things, it was fun. We had a lot of fun. Did you have fun last year? We laughed together. We had a great time together. So come to Renewal Retreat. All right, and we're in the middle of a fast. As Jeff said, it's a 21-day fast, not a 40-day fast. So grace of God be on you. All right, 21 days. And so we're in like day 14, I think, today. And so we have one more week of fasting. Next week, we celebrate it with our pancake breakfast, breaking the fast. And we fast together so that we can have an increasing awareness of the world's suffering and pain, so that we can have an increasing compassion and empathy for others, so that our hearts might be aligned with God's will. That's why Christians fast. That's why the people of God have always fasted. We do it so that we can grow closer to God and that we can invite other people to partner with us. That's why we fast. It's a, it's a discipline that allows us to look and see the works of God all through the year. I guarantee you, you could point back to January or February and say, man, I see the work of God, and that's because of what he committed to us and what I committed to him during my fast. Amen? So we're fasting, and and we want to fast so that we can be more like Christ, so that we can be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. In fact, that's our vision here for our congregation, is to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. And in this series that I've been preaching on, talking about all joy We had the question, what does it look like for somebody? What's the evidence of someone who is being filled? Well, the Apostle Paul says it is somebody who's developing the characteristics of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life and the Spirit is in charge of your life, then what the Spirit produces in your life is love and joy and peace. And so we want to lean in this year into joy. We want to be people who are all 
joy. We're experiencing joy in the name of Jesus. Um, and so joy is our theme. It is our vision for this year. It comes from Romans 15 and verse 13. Can you read this passage with me? When we get to the part that's underlined and capitalized, can you just say it loudly? Will you do that for me? Okay. May the God of hope, wait, y'all read it with me. All right, you, did you, were y'all reading with me? All right. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand together because we're going to be in Acts chapter 11 verses 19 through 26 today. Help me read God's word by reading aloud the words that are in yellow. Uh, This is the word of God for the people of God. Meanwhile, The believers who had scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul, also known as Paul, When he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. This is a reading from God's Word. If you believe in God's Word, say, I believe in the Word of God. God. Would you please say, "Stay stay true to God. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much this morning. All right, if you don't know, uh, Luke writes this gospel, and, and earlier in chapter 7, uh, we see something that happens. Uh, we witness the first follower of Jesus martyred. That's recorded in scriptures. It's Stephen. He was stoned to death in Jerusalem by members of the Sanhedrin after being falsely accused of cursing Moses. And Saul, later referred to as Paul, was there in this narrative giving approval of Stephen's death. He was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen to death. And the murder of Stephen and the persecution that followed scattered all the believers who were in Jerusalem, but allowed them, though, to share the gospel of Jesus beyond Jerusalem into Samaria. And many Jewish disciples shared the gospel even beyond Samaria into Gentile territory, Gentiles, in Antioch of Syria, what today would be the southernmost part of Turkey. So the believers didn't take the fact that Stephen died and and that persecution was coming. That means they were seeking to harm them, maybe even do the same for them, not only lock them up in, in jail, but maybe they could lose their lives for following Jesus. This was they could suffer real harm for following Jesus, bodily harm for following Jesus, but they didn't they didn't take that as a dead end to God's work. They didn't take that as a dead end to sharing God's word. In fact, God used the disciples fleeing persecution to spread the good news all over the place about his son. God used the persecution to fulfill the promises that Jesus told his disciples would happen. He said, the power will come on you and you'll be be given this gospel. You'll be sharing this word. You'll be giving it to the Jews, to the Samaritans, to Jerusalem, to Samaria, and, and to the ends of the earth. Like You'll be giving them all this good news. And so God used this hard time to bless people. And the Word of God says that enough people turned to the Lord 
that a Gentile church was born. That enough people had received the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as salvation for them. They believed enough of them had started a church together. But it had already started, like the Gentile movement, the Gentile revival, uh, salvation to the Gentiles started before, prior with Peter. That Peter, in the beginning of Acts chapter 11, is, is recalling, he's giving testimony of the good works of God. Just before our reading today, Peter is, is recounting what God had done, explaining to his fellow Jewish brothers in Jerusalem what happened when God gave him multiple visions multiple visions for him to go to the home of Cornelius and preach the gospel to him and his Gentile household. Cornelius gathered all the people together to hear the good news of God preached by Peter and the disciples. And so Peter does, and in the middle of him preaching, I mean, it was some phenomenal preaching because uh, the Holy Spirit fell on all the Gentiles in the house just like it did in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And they referred to it as just the same as in the beginning, in the beginning is how they referred to it. Like, like the Holy Spirit fell on them. And so who was Peter? All right, it took, it took God to give Peter three separate visions for Peter to believe that he was to break the threshold of a Gentile's house, making himself unclean ceremonially, to be in the home of a Gentile, something he had never done. All right, it gave him three God gave him three visions for him to see like all these animals that Peter had never feasted upon, okay? Like shellfish and all that stuff. Like, like Peter's like, I've never once had any of that touch my mouth. I've been ceremonial clean all my life. And, and now you're asking me that everything that you have made is good to eat and every person is good to share the word of God with. Like I can go into their home and do that. Like it, Peter was stubborn. It took a, a lot. I mean, by, for you, maybe it'd only take, you know, Two, two visions. <laughs> I was going to say one, but some of us maybe take five visions. I don't know, right? Peter had to get three of them. And he was convinced. He was finally convinced, and he went, and he obeyed the Lord. And when he was preaching, in the middle of him preaching, the Holy Spirit falls, and now Peter said, who can deny? Who can deny these people baptism? Who could, the, we saw it. You saw it. You saw it. You saw it. You saw it. Who can deny these people are a part of the kingdom of God, right? So it falls on them. They're all baptized into Christ. God was on the move. The church was on the move. The Holy Spirit was on the move. The church was new, and God was doing a new thing in his kingdom. The Jerusalem church... Here's word about, I mean, they get word from Peter about it. And so they're like deliberating, who should, what should we do? Who should we send? So they send Barnabas to investigate. And Barnabas did not discourage. No, in fact, verse 23 says, when he arrived, he saw this evidence of God's blessing and he was filled with joy. I mean, Barnabas being a, a faithful Jew and Barnabas being a follower of the way, I mean, he knew that the word of God wasn't exclusive to just the Jews. Like, he knew that the blessings of God weren't just exclusive to the Jews. If he had been reading and paying careful attention, he knew that God had always wanted all people in all flesh to receive the Holy Spirit. And Barnabas may have knew the prophecies of Joel. Today, you might find it in your Fast 21 reading that that the reading today is from the book of Joel, and where after they fasted, then Joel says that, A confirmation of the work of God will be that the Holy Spirit will fall and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Like it will fall on all flesh. The Holy Spirit will fall on all flesh, all people, sons and daughters will prophesy. Like it's, no, the Holy Spirit will fall and maybe some people might have had an inclination to say and nobles and kings and royalty will prophesy and governors and and, and people of wealth, right? Proud people will prophesy and prophesy. And all the men will prophesy. All the boys and all the young boys and all the old men will prophesy. No, he says, your sons and daughters, all flesh, everybody will receive this. It was a confirmation. Barnabas was going with, I think, an eager expectation to see the work of God. Because when he sees, he doesn't hesitate. The word doesn't say he hesitates. He's filled with joy. He's like, wow, 
The word of God's being fulfilled in my day. I get to see God working. I mean, what we've been reading about, the stories we've been telling, I get to see it. Look, look at these people. They're not even Jewish. They're not even Jewish. And they're, they're praising the God that, that created me in all things, the God who holds all things together, the Jesus who, who rose from the dead. Like these people, like he didn't go and say, what are you doing? He didn't say, what are you doing? It doesn't even look anything like temple worship. It doesn't look like anything like temple worship. Like where are your sacrifices? Right? No, it was totally different. I would imagine the Gentile church looked radically different. They, and they weren't perfect. I'm sure they had some pretty weird things they were doing. Like, oh my gosh, what the, were they doing with that tambourine up there? Right? You know? It's supposed to be funny. Oh, come on. That's a... You know who I miss? I miss Mike Harlow being in here. Oh my gosh, I miss Mike Harlow being in here. Mark Harlow, man, we want you to get well. You know, he's in California. He's had a double lung transplant. He's still got an infection. Six more weeks, he says, so we're hoping that his infections clear up when he comes back because Mike had a hearty laugh, and he was very generous with it. Thank God. <laughs> and uh, I spoke with him this week, and, you know, just a little setback, but hopefully we'll get to see him. You know, we need somebody like that. You know, my jokes are moderately funny, but he made them sound a whole lot more funny than they were. <laughs> I mean, there, there's joy in the movement of God, and Barnabas experiences joy. He sees it. There's joy when God does a new thing, and we get to witness it. There's joy. There's joy in that. And so there's a few things that I want to pull from this for us, okay? The first one is this. It's what Barnabas, after experiencing the work of God and the blessings of God and with joy, what does he do to encourage them? He says, stay true to God. That's what he tells them. Stay true to God. Can, can somebody say, stay true to God for me? Stay true to God. This is really our bottom line. I got some other points that I want to make, but this is it. Stay true to God. And I looked it up at betterhelp.com. I mean, you can, this is like, um, this is like uh, kind of lazy internet research for me. Um, it was the first one that came up. It was probably an ad. But I like, the, I like the definition that they gave about staying true to yourself. Have you heard that? Stay true to yourself. Staying true to yourself means you act in harmony with who you are, and what you believe. That's not a bad definition. Who you are and what you believe. It means that your insides, your feelings and beliefs match your outsides, your actions. That's betterhelp.com. Stay true to yourself. And I was thinking, well, what does Barnabas mean here by saying stay true to God? Stay true to God. Well, I think it's that when I see the movement of God, when I see that he's making things new, that I encourage others to stay true and I encourage myself to stay true to what I have experienced in the Lord. Stay true to what you have experienced in the Lord. Some of you say, well, Javon, you need to stay true to the word of God. Well, sure, but they didn't have. These Gentiles didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a Bible. I mean, all they had was like some random person fleeing persecution, telling them about Jesus, and they believe, and a whole community develops. I mean, these guys were amazing. These guys were amazing. What'd you say? Let me hear that again. Like, this is what, this is all they had. They didn't have a, you know, a scroll. They didn't have nothing, man. They just like were just eyewitness, just verbal testimony, and they believed. Like, so they're like, what did they have? They had the experience of what they believe. They have the experience of what they believe. And you may have heard me say this, and sometimes it sounds blasphemous, but we don't follow the Bible. We follow a living, risen Son of God. That's who the Bible points us to. That's, our faith is based off Jesus. Like, Jesus is the foundation of our faith. And when you take Jesus on, you take his words. Yes, of course. And how do we explore his words? Yes, we find it in the Word of God, but it's not. This isn't the goal. Jesus has always been the goal, and so they get this, and they experience it. And so, Barnabas is like, stay true to what you've experienced, and that's what we must do. You must stay true to God. Stay true to God no matter what, with all your heart, that God's blessings will confirm your faith in him, and your faith in him will affirm his blessings. You must confirm what you have experienced with his word. You must confirm what you have experienced with the Spirit and his character. Stay true to God. And then also this, embrace and celebrate change. Embrace and celebrate change. Embrace and celebrate. Not celebrated. Sorry, guys. Embrace and celebrate change. That's not Mike's fault. He just copies what I give him, and that's my fault. Embrace and celebrate change. Uh, Barnabas um, embraced and celebrated change. Sometimes the thing that what happens is, is a very harsh critique sometimes of Christians is, like, we, we, we don't like any change. Like, 
Church people don't like any change. We don't like any change. We want everything to stay just the way it is, right? Right? Everything's changing around us. We just want church to be the same, right? That's true, right? Have you said, and we want it to be a safe space. Like, don't throw any curveballs at us. Like, we just want to, you know what I mean? Don't mess up that order of worship. And you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like, 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 let's like keep everything. Let's stay in our lane. You know what I mean? Like, don't mess with anything. Like, just, we don't want any change in our lives. Even though everything changes around us. I think that's why we don't want change here. Like, we just want to just like keep it just the same. You know, let's like keep it just the same, right? But our kids are growing up. They go through multiple phases. Your work goes through multiple phases, Right? You become empty nesters, then you retire or whatever, you know, everything's changing, you know, change. And then, and then we also had neglect of believing what God says about a human being and in their interaction with Jesus, like that, that we're being transformed. There's like perpetual change in our lives, like we're being changed, changed, you're being changed. And some of us apply what we want to happen like liturgically in the church to our lives. Like we're just like, well, I arrived, I got baptized and now, you know, hey, let's just kind of lock it in kind of lock it in, right? That's not what my preacher told me 20 years ago, lock it in. That's what my daddy told me 30 years ago, lock it in. Normalize all these things. Nope, there's no room for any kind of change, growth, no revisiting. There's no advancing, no moving forward. Just stay where you're at. Hold down. Dig your heels in. Dig your heels in. Dig them in hard. But instead, what we find in the early church, they celebrated rapid change. New people, new people, new people, new people. Oh my gosh, new people. New people. Oh, there's so many. You, could you imagine how many? They, they couldn't keep up with everybody. They couldn't keep up with everybody. New people, oh, they just love it, love it. Barnabas cultivated the joy that he felt. He reproduced the blessings of God when he celebrated change. When you're able to celebrate and embrace change, that's what you're able to do. Here, in fact, here's another application I want you to understand. When we celebrate and embrace change, we cultivate joy, reproducing the blessings of God. And more and more people are brought to God. Because when you're open to change, you're open to new people. When you're open to change, you're open to new experiences of God. When you're open to change, you're open to new disciplines of God. When you're open to change, you're open to me, you changing your mind on something. When you're open to change, you're open to Jesus taking you into a place you've never been before, like taking you to a place you were once afraid and you'd never go, uh, doing experiences you were once terrified of but you'd never do, right? Prayers you would never pray, but now you pray them because you're open to the change of Jesus Christ. You're open to him. Is everybody tracking with me? You have to be open to change as a follower of Jesus. We we are some of the most prolific change agents in this world. Like, we step into situations and we have hard situations in our life that deserve, that require, that, that need change. And we're able to experience that because of Jesus. Because Jesus is, is the savior of change. Jesus is that. And then number three, make new connections. Make new connections. That's what I love about Barnabas. Barnabas makes these new connections. Barnabas goes and gets Saul. Nobody trusts Saul. I mean, he, he approved of Stephen's death. Nobody trusts him. Like when he went and met with the disciples up in Jerusalem, they were, all, they were like, this guy's sus. You know what I mean? That means suspicious, everybody. But he grabs him and introduces Saul to the church in Antioch, just like he did when he took Saul and introduced him to the apostles, to James and all them in Jerusalem. Mars like, let me go get Saul. And I I think about this. Barnabas Barnabas was such an encourager. He was a guide. What have we talked about ourselves in here? We're not we're not just pointing people to where to go. We're 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 guiding them. This is hands-on stuff. Barnabas goes and grabs them and he connects them. It makes sense to me for Barnabas to do so. Because Paul had his own powerful conversion in Acts chapter 9, if you remember, if you don't know. He was on his way to persecute Christians on the road to Damascus. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 says this, God said that Saul, a.k.a. Paul, was his chosen instrument to proclaim his name to the Gentiles and their kings. So when he's struck blind on the road to Damascus and Jesus comes to, Jesus comes to him and then 
and, and he sees them, and then he's struck blind, and, and, and when, he, when, he, when he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And Saul's like, Lord, I'm so sorry. And, and, then, and then he also gives him a purpose. He's like, you're going to go and tell this message to Gentiles. You're most adequately equipped to tell them to the Jews, being a Pharisee among Pharisees and being somebody who is uh, expertly trained in the law. But God sends them to the Gentiles. And I think, I think Barnabas knows this story because Paul has probably had to tell it multiple times. And so Barnabas helps Saul, a.k.a. Paul, to stay true to God and to live into his calling. I've got the guy. Wait, wait here, church. I'll be back in a few weeks. I've got the guy. You've got to meet this guy. I've got the guy. He brings the guy. And both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was actually at Antioch where we get the term Christians. That's where they first started to be called Christians is at Antioch. Isn't that amazing? And Barnabas says, I, I wonder what that was like. Hey, listen. I remember what you said, like God said that he was going to use you to go to the Gentiles. Well, look, there's a whole Gentile church, and they're real green, and they need what you have. They, they need to meet you. You need to meet them. Let's go teach them, encourage them. Let's make disciples out of them. Let's help them to transform more and more into the image of Jesus. Let's, let's give them a place. Let's give them a community. Let's give them the love of God. And so Barnabas and Saul connected with the Antioch Christians and stayed there to build strong relationships with them to help them connect with God and connect with one another and to connect with people who had yet to believe, to build strong relationships, which is part of our vision here. We believe that's a linchpin thing that we need to do. We need to build strong relationships with people so that they can experience the power and life of God. And so large crowds of people came to know Jesus. And what we learned from Barnabas about making connections is, is that we connect people to other people. We connect people into living out their calling, so help them discover their purpose, and we connect people to the broader church. Because one of the amazing things is, then other people started coming, you know, guest preachers, guest prophets are coming through, like Agabus, and Agabus prophesies that there's going to be a severe famine, and it's going to affect the people of God in Jerusalem. And so when the Gentile Christians hear about their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem who they've never met, whom maybe they feel a little sideways about them sometimes, like maybe they didn't accept them at one time, but now they're part of this all-accepting community. You know what happens to them? They feel compassion for the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and their meager means or whatever they have, they pull it together, and they're going to bless them by sending a gift with Barnabas and Paul. Do you see that, church? Like that we are, there's something bigger than ourselves. When we experience and cultivate joy in our lives, when we open our hearts up to experience and cultivate change in our lives, then, then we have an open heart to, to accept someone else who we've never met or accept a cause or a work. Like we can, we can pour ourselves into it and be generous to it. And, and they did. And they gave a gift. And I would say, you know, in this world we see a lot of bad things. In this world we have a lot of pain and suffering. You might say, for someone who, who is cynical in this world, Someone might say, I have a difficult time believing in God because I've seen too much. Is that fair to say? Does that make sense? Right? I, I, I have a hard time believing in a creator God or a compassionate God or a God of love. I have a hard time experiencing joy. I, have a, I, cannot, I have a hard time experiencing joy because, because the trauma in my life. Someone may very, very well say that, and that's a real thing, right? That's real. That's real. Um, I've seen too much. I've experienced too much. But as a follower of Jesus, we have the opportunity, the ability, the empowerment to interpret things differently. In fact, we can say, as someone might say, I, I've seen too much to believe in God. Someone else might say, in this room, I believe your testimony would be, I've seen too much not to believe in God. Amen? And Barnabas had seen too much. He'd seen too much, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, the word describes him. That you must be like Barnabas and confirm what you've experienced with his word, his spirit, and his character with joy. That we have the ability to even see hard things and experience hard things and still be able, because of the grace of God, 
to say, I see God working. I experience God. And that's how you can be filled with all joy. That's how the same event can hit two people, people differently. That's how you could say, I've seen God working. I've seen too much. I've seen his goodness too much. And the Holy Spirit confirms I'm strong in the faith because I believe. And so I'll stay true to God. It just says, stay true to God. I'll stay true to God. I will hold on no matter what. I'll believe because of what I've experienced and I'll confirm it with the people of God, with the word of God, with the character of God. I will confirm it. I've seen too much. I will stay true to God. Let's stand together. If you have experienced God in some way and want to receive the prayers of the church, um, you can do so. Please, uh, you can text uh, the, the number on the screen. You can give your prayers in the chat. If you want to give a praise, I, I love getting um, you guys' testimony by email, how you've been experiencing God through this fast. Thank you so much. Keep sending me more and more emails about your experiences and share them with you and, and even sharing your experiences of joy. Thank you, church, for that. And would you maybe, maybe share that experience with someone besides your pastor? Right? Share it with a friend this week. Send that email to somebody. Say, here's how I've experienced God. All right? And I believe when you do those things, those acts of obedience, you're staying true to him. Holy Father, I thank you so much for your love and your generosity. Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit, for the story, for Barnabas. May we be all encouragers of one another, cultivating joy, embracing change. Holy Father, may we mm, live with great anticipation and eagerness of the newness that you bring us in your kingdom. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.